My name is Elisa Harrigan. When I was 16 years old, I was recruited by Canada's most dangerous white supremacist group, the Heritage Trend, and became its poster girl. They became the family I never had. But the more pride we had in our skin color, the more we hated anybody who wasn't like us. After they started targeting women and gay activists for harassment and attack, I had to confront the fact that I too was gay. I was 18 years old before I spied on the heritage for several months before I defected, turned information over to police, testified against group leaders, and helped to shut down the group. Today I have a criminology degree and work to combat radicalization. And over the years I've seen a lot of films showing young people joining extremist groups. But women's experiences are often missing from the narrative. And that's why Combat Girls is such a unique and important movie because it shows womanhood as a primal force. You see raw sexuality, anger, fights, girls not playing nice, defying the stereotype that women stick up for each other and they're either passive doormats or innocent damsels who need rescuing. The main character of Marissa is breathtakingly cruel in many scenes, yet desperate for love and even naive in other times. Combat Girls is the story of two young girls on the opposite ends of the radicalization trajectory. Marissa is a 20-year-old female skinhead who is angry, proud of her swastika tattoos, and takes part in fights alongside her violent skinhead boyfriend. She's been in the movement for years, and like nearly all women who join hate groups, was indoctrinated by a man, in her case, her Nazi sympathizer grandfather. On the other side of the continuum, 15-year-old Svenja is just starting to dabble in hate. She doesn't have the strength to assert herself in a home where her oppressive stepfather controls everything she does. She feels stifled and is drawn to angry people who embody danger and power. I understand that seduction because after I joined the Heritage Front, I went from being powerless to powerful practically overnight. At just 16, I felt invincible and strong, protected by my comrades, and I could finally talk back to adults. For younger kids, joining a group that's taboo can seem like the most anti-establishment thing you can do. It's that secret thrill of forbidden material not taught in school and partaking in a counterculture that your parents reject that makes it even more appealing. Marissa, just like countless other disenfranchised young people who become radicalized, doesn't have many prospects. She's stuck in an unfulfilling dead-end job and longs for the racial pride embodied in her country's past. All the working class skinheads in the movie are seeking a sense of belonging, but they all seem lost and disconnected, brought together only by racism, heavy drinking, and violence. None of them have a positive vision of the future. Instead, they're fighting to recreate a future that belongs in the past. Marissa's nostalgia is also wrapped up in her love for her fascist grandfather. The biggest difference I've seen between men and women who join white supremacist groups has to do with motives. Both genders join because they're lonely, angry, or just bored and have no friends. But women tend to be motivated by love, while men are typically motivated by anger. Skinheads will also put the concept of Aryan motherhood on a pedestal and justify violence with the excuse, we're fighting for the future of white women and children, while privately treating women as unequal sex objects. Love and acceptance are key factors for women who join hate groups. When I became a neo-Nazi, the more I hated, the more my racist family loved me. I was an exception in that I didn't have a boyfriend, but most women leave the far right when they get either pregnant or break up with their boyfriend. They suddenly realize that they don't wanna live in that world and they don't, want, they don't want their child to grow up surrounded by hate. The few women I've seen who are incapable of distancing themselves from extremism often will lose custody of their children. Hate groups operate much like cults, Love bombing is followed by escalation of commitment, and it's extremely difficult to escape without having a supportive circle to help you transition back to normal life. And to see that those that you hate are just human beings just like you with hopes and dreams no different than yours. Marissa finally starts questioning her choices after she befriends an Afghan boy named Rasul, who shows her kindness, and she realizes that he's not that different from her. They are both lost and both dream of a place where they belong. Rasul clings onto a tattered postcard of Sweden where he thinks he will be welcomed and have a better life, while Marissa holds onto her grandfather's old books as relics of a Germany where she thinks she would have had a better life. There's a scene near the end where Marissa says she once believed that if only this happens or that happens, I can really start to live. Meanwhile, 
life slips through your fingers. And in that moment, she understands that she's not condemned to fight for a violent and misogynist Nazi homeland. She can break free of her grandfather's past and choose to live. And others have the right to live too and be happy. Her life, albeit imperfect, is the only one that she has. And she has the power to choose life over death and destruction. She redeems herself. And through her awakening, she saves two other young people. Sadly for her, however, and for others who are caught in the brutal world of extremism, this is a realization that often comes too late.